Good. Right, so this, this week, uh, hopefully, uh, everything that we've done should come to focus now. Everything that we've looked at really uh, comes together with our panelling and especially with SSL. So you should see everything in the lab today that we've actually covered up to now. Hashing, symmetric key, public key, key exchange, all comes together in, in a single <laughs> instance when it comes to, to tunneling. And tunneling is one of the most fundamental areas uh, in detecting data. If you are in Starbucks, say, uh, connecting to public Wi-Fi, you have massive risks. So you've got to understand uh, the data that could be taken uh, from your uh, your connection. Even the connection through HTTPS, uh, it's possible to see the details of what you're actually uh, connecting to. So we need to understand both the limitations of SSL <coughs> and also its strengths, but to look at other uh, more preferred methods, which is to use a proper VPN and, and, a, and, a, and an IPsec, IPsec as, a, as a protocol. So this is where we are, and it just seems like yesterday that we kind of started our, our route. So we're at uh, uh, tunneling here, week eight, and next week we have our tests. So there's no lecture next week, our, our test is scheduled in for a lab time for uh, campus-based students and at another time for our, uh, our non-campus-based students. There should be a study guide online for you to, to, to go through, so make sure over the weekend you read all the questions and you're able to answer them in a good time. Uh, there is the details of what each questions are, is, is, is all about, uh, and we'll have a WebEx on Monday at 6.30, so you can all join if you want, uh, but on the Slack channel you can ask a question uh, at any time, okay? So try not to broadcast the question to the whole class, uh, or even answers if you don't want to. Uh, try to send a one-to-one -one, uh, message. Okay, so there should be a study guide on the site for the test. And I've given you lots of questions and I'll add in some more and it'll give you some idea about what you need to study. Does anybody have any questions about the test? It's what, 30%? It's open book. It's in the lab. <laughs> yeah, please ask questions before it gets too late. Uh, try to avoid last minute studying uh, and so if, if, if you can. Okay, so along with that, you should find the coursework is there. Uh, pick your subject that you're most interested in and start to look at it. A question I was asked uh, from a distance student is that they can they do a bit of one thing and a bit of another thing if they go for quantum robust cryptography and find it's too difficult. Could you do a little bit of that and a little bit of lightweight crypto? Yes. If you can make a coherent story around why you've selected these two areas and you went down the rabbit hole with one and it didn't quite work, then that's fine. At least you've kind of tried and pushed yourself a little bit. And if you end up just doing standard lightweight crypto, then that, that, that's okay. So the lit review is maybe focusing on a certain area and so on, but maybe your implementation, make sure you've grabbed some code of GitHub, run the code and see if you can get it to, to work. Pick your language of choice, node.js, Python, if you're a C++ geek, that's fine. <laughs> Flash, if you want. Uh, it is it's Angular, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. What really matters is that you can get the code running, and, and test it, and then hopefully evaluate it at, at the end. Does anybody have any questions about the coursework? I appreciate it's not your main focus. 
Just now, we want to get a test out the way. Okay, so so once we get the test out the way, then I'll come back to this and we can go into it in more detail. So this is the model that we started off with, and this is where we are now. And this kind of link brings together all of this. So to be able to create our symmetric key tunnel, so very few tunnels are symmetric key because symmetric key is optimised. These days, it's probably not uh, AES. Let me shock you. What's the other method do you think that's, that's increasingly popular? PGP. PGP, no, for the symmetric key. PGP, cha-cha. So cha-cha, you'll find if you use an SSH in, in the lab today, and SFTP, you'll find it's probably cha-cha that's, that's under there. A stream, cipher, quick, fast, three times faster than, than AES, often. Okay, so we've got our, our symmetric key in there, it could be AES or cha-cha, <laughs> or our lightweight crypto. Uh, we have a key exchange method. It won't be Diffie-Hellman, because Diffie-Hellman has been mainly cracked. So it'll be Diffie-Hellman with some sort of enhancement. So when you're connecting to Wi-Fi here just now, the method you'll be using is elliptic curve uh, Diffie-Hellman. If you use a Tor browser, it's elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. Uh, if you use uh, Bitcoins, there's elliptic curve in there. So most of the time now, it's elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman is doing the, the key negotiation uh, in there. And we'll find out today in the lab, hopefully, what that looks like when we look at the Warshak traces. Our hashing method is chosen. And then we have our certificate there to prove that Bob is Bob or Alice is Alice and so on. So we have our horrible PKI that we looked at last week. And that's the core essence is also around the signing of things. So how does Bob sign proof that he is sending things? He uses his public key and his private key to be able to sign the, the messages and the data. Okay, so hopefully in this lecture it will bring it all together and we'll be able to see our, our, uh, uh, our system. So before we start, and I'll go into the detail of what SSL does, and the client hello and the client server. So how do you assess how do you assess the cryptography that you that you use? So normally what happens is that the client will offer up a whole bag of uh, ciphers that it wants to use. So it might say uh, I want to use SHA1 and I want to use AES or RC4. And then the client and the server must negotiate a contract and end up, through the ciphers that have been uh, uh, offered, then the client and server will agree on a contract. So that contract includes the key exchange method, the symmetric key method, and size, and what else? The hashing algorithm. So if you took, take those three things together, that's the contract fine. So when you connect to a VPN, your server gives you a whole choice of things that you can connect, and you'll pick off whichever one that you prefer in there. Unfortunately, there's what's called a downgrade attack, and it's possible for an adversary to pick off the weakest cipher possible and crack the connection. So freak. Beast, logjam, all those major vulnerabilities have been caused by a downgrade uh, attack where it's possible to pick off the lowest line fruit uh, and, and uh, compromise it. So the SSL labs is probably the first place that we would look to be able to assess the security of our, of our, our site. So to get an A+, plus, you've really got to be really good <laughs> and everything's got to be perfect in terms of your crypto. There is no weaknesses at all in anything that you select. What's the downside of you getting an A plus? 
do you think? Power consumption? Power consumption, it could be, yeah. But there, there's something a bit more fundamental. Some users cannot access to your site because they use standard and software. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so the biggest argument is that if I don't support RC4 anymore, then somebody with Windows XP, Internet Explorer, uh, and patched won't be able to connect to your site. And the choice you've got as a business is whether it's you've got half of your half of your users coming in with Windows XP and patched, or if it's only one in a in a lifetime that somebody comes in on that. In fact, it's actually a bot that's coming in and it's bad anyway. And then you want to kick that off your site as quickly as uh, as you can. So in the assessment that we have, we will uh, we get some sort of idea about the actual weaknesses that we have. So you can see this one's been, once it's been scanned, then it's in the kind of cache area of SSL labs. So the good thing is that, is that it's not you that's scanning uh, the site, so no one will call you up and say you've been pen testing my site. It will come from uh, Qual, uh, Qualsys and the SSL, SSL labs. So as we saw before, then we see the certificate information and uh, the site can have more than one uh, certificate. Then what we get is the protocol that it supports. Never, ever, ever allow SSL2 on your site. There are many sites that still support it, uh, but it has been shown to be insecure. SSL3 is the same as SSL TLS 1.0, roughly, uh, and it has weaknesses. Your starting point is probably around TLS 1.1, if you can, <coughs> but you want to be migrating away from that. TLS 1.2 is the current standard in the industry, and as I'll explain later, the TLS 1.3 came along and addresses some of the problems uh, of the past in there. So the best sites will enable TLS 1.3, and I think Chrome and Firefox now support a TLS 1.3 uh, connection. So if you're going to set it up, then go ahead and, and set it up, but you've got to leave the older ones actually in, in there. And then what it does, it will actually define you the cipher suite for each cipher suite, whether it's weak or not. So this is the key exchange method, RSA. Uh, so uh, Google sends you their public key, you create a, a key, symmetric key, you encrypt it with their public key, you send it back and Google will decrypt that with a private key. So what's the problem with that? Why has that method been kicked off uh, TLS 1.3? So Google sends you their public key and the certificate that you're going to check anyway. You create your session key, encrypt with their public key, send it back, Google decrypts with a private key, and then we've got our symmetric key for the tunnel. What's the weakness of that, do you think? They lose the private key. What is it? They lose the private key. Uh, they could use the private key. So if somebody <coughs> discovers the private key, such as an employee within Google, and actually <coughs> leaks that to the world, then if you've recorded all of the, the network traffic that's been created in the past, then it's all broken. So that's called forward secrecy, and you've got to make sure that one breach of your keys doesn't unrip all of the keys from the past. So TLS 1.3 gets rid of that, that method because it seemed to be uh, weak. So you can see that's the problem here, in that it doesn't like this uh, RSA method that's identifying it as weak. So we're using RSA for the key exchange, we're using 256-bit AES with CBC, and we're using SHA-1 uh, as our uh, hashing method. Uh, and it's identified as, as weak. The green ones are the best practice. Uh, AES GCM is a good method in there. Uh, and you'll even find three DES. In fact, you might even find DES. <laughs> In, in there. Uh, so when you do your assessment it will actually define where you're weak 
and if you've got a client that you're working with and they go and test your website and it has a B grade and you say you're supporting a bad uh, cipher then you could you could lose a con you could lose a contract it's your front door if you're not securing your web infrastructure you've kind of got you you're kind of not watching your, your 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 front door there so then it tells you for each of the uh, the systems that would connect in where the the problem would come in so if you lost TLS 1.0 if you didn't support that anymore you're losing Android 4. Does anybody know what Android version we're on? I don't know myself, but uh, maybe Android, what are we? Anybody know what iOS we're on for Apple? 12. 12, yeah. And for Android? 9. 9. Okay, so we're going to kick off Android 6 and 7, which might not seem a problem for you, but uh, you'll find in some countries of the world they take old Android phones and give them uh, to people. So there are people still running Nokia old Android things because you get updates all the time. It doesn't mean that's going to happen if you don't have good connectivity. So you'll find that in here they'll actually outline all of the cipher suites. If you dropped them, what would actually drop off? And then they'll give you an assessment about whether it's weak against drowned pu beast poodle log jam, heart bleed, and so on. Luckily, heart bleed is gone. Uh, and it's good it's gone because it was the most severe vulnerability that has ever happened on the internet. Basically, with a single ping packet, single packet, you could read the memory, 64K of memory running on the server. That end, a random bit of memory, which just happened to have user passwords and keys and so on. So. Hopefully that's gone, and there's no excuse for you not to be running a patch system for that. Uh, and then it'll give you all the extra things that you actually need. So the second assessment that you can make is, is to uh, match to the, the OWASP top 10. So in the, can you say what's in the OWASP top 10? What's, what's number one? Side scripting is number three. SQL Don't injection. quote me on that. SQL well, inje yeah. injection. Yeah. So injection is the the number one. So is it possible for me to inject code into your site and to run things? And in many cases, it it, it is uh, to copy and paste URLs to inject through the post or the get and so on. And uh, can I breach uh, do you have weak components on your, on your website and so on. So there's a new uh, standard for <coughs> headers called X headers and these address many of the problems of the past. So with an X header you can define where your content is coming in from. So if I just say that my site I only allow Twitter images and YouTube if any images appear or any content appear from a, a, out with those two trusted sites, then I, the user won't be able to load it. If I say for my iframes, I only want YouTube, then if somebody goes and injects uh, their own code into my page, looks like my page, then it will, will stop uh, loading it. So the Scott Helmy uh, site, and please have a look at his work and his blogs and everything that, that, that he does. He set up this website. Uh, Scott has been scanning the internet for many years. So if you want to find out what Google crypto Google used five years ago, you'll probably find that Scott has the scan of it. So he's continually scanning. Uh, if you're interested, we've published papers with them to look at what we call the state of the internet, to find out. Uh, so he knows exactly how many Let's Encrypt certificates there are, how many VeriSign certificates, what crypto each site is using, uh, and so on. And to get an A+, and my site won't get an A+, unfortunately, because I had to take my headers off. I did have it as an A+, but uh, once you do it, then it, it becomes difficult. You've got to make sure all your JavaScript is coming 
from your own site <coughs> and then all of the uh, other things that, that go on in there. So as I remember, I might get a B. I get a B. <laughs> so I've got a few little things in there. So I've got a content security policy in there. And the content security policy means I can define where my content is, is coming from. And anything that comes from anywhere else is breaching the policy and you won't be able to connect. And it's really quite difficult to that. I've got my cross-site scripting uh, header on. So it's, it protects against that number three uh, OWASP attack that people can't inject uh, code into, into my pages, hopefully. Uh, I don't have that one on because I had to turn it off. And then there's the, the extra X frame uh, header in there. OK, so the, it'll actually give you the detail about what your problem is on your, on your site. Uh, but everybody really needs to be moving towards this kind of standard in there. I'll give you the, the details of, of what each header is actually doing. To get an A+, you've probably got to be someone like Cloudflare. And let's have a little look to see what they do. It's taken a little minute to do it. So while that's doing that, I'll just pick one that already has an A+. Okay, so there's an A+, and you can see it's supporting these additional uh, headers there uh, for the security. One that's pretty significant is your, uh, uh, your public key pinning. So your public key just can't change in an instance. So the key pinning allows, uh, allows you to make sure that the certificate doesn't change between you connecting to it now and when you connect to it in the future. Has anybody been on uh, Edinburgh bus or on a, on a train recently and it stops you from accessing like HTTPS for, for a site? Anybody get that? It detects there's a man in the middle. You do know that there is a man in the middle or a person in the middle <laughs> when you connect to your public Wi-Fi. You do know when you use HTTPS you get adverts uh, there's the if you use this certificate pinning, it knows that there's a bit of fakeness going on in your connection, and it's not really connecting to YouTube. So with this, you can limit uh, some of the sites that you that you actually connect to, uh, and uh, but it will it will strengthen your your, your infrastructure. Okay, so that, that's the two main uh, scanners that, that, that we use uh, for that. Okay, so that's the, have a look at uh, Scott Helmy's uh, site, and they're sponsored by Sophos, I think it is, or it will not sponsored by someone else then. Okay, so this is our, our generic uh, outline of what a tunnel actually looks like. Unfortunately, we've got to go into an untrusted network somewhere. In fact, everything that we've got in our even in our network is, is untrusted. <coughs> so the risks are that Eve will eavesdrop uh, on the connection. Eve will set up a proxy uh, for us. Uh, smart firewalls will actually do that for you. Eve could change the packets. And if you're in Starbucks, then Eve could broadcast an ARP request, an ARP uh, reply, uh, and spoof the, the gateway. So as far as you can tell, you're concerned, you're still connected to uh, the, the public Wi-Fi gateway in Starbucks here, but actually you're connecting to someone's <coughs> laptop that is right beside you. ARP, unfortunately, is a very poor uh, protocol, uh, and uh, ARP spoofing isn't too difficult. And if Eve manages to get your connection half the time, and then the gate with the other half, then you have risks around that. So we need some way to encrypt the data. We need some authentication uh, of it so that uh, Eve can replay uh, our packets. And we need some integrity to make sure that we know that uh, Eve hasn't changed uh, anything. So the way that we normally do this is either with a, a tunneling mode so our tunneling mode tunnels just through the public network that we're worried about, 
or we could go for complete end-to-end -end, uh, encryption uh, through uh, transport mode. So which mode do you think is most preferred in a, in a company? If you're in a bank, which one do you think you're likely to be using? A cryptic uh, uh, tunneling mode or transport mode? Tunneling. Tunneling. So why? Why is that the case? Because they can add some filters in the middle. Yeah, uh, not in the middle, but uh, here. So they can uh, <coughs> make sure. Oops. They can make sure that uh, they can look at the traffic here and here if it's email. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you showed this diagram last time. I'm still kind of lost. Where Where is that line on the top diagram actually centered on? Like yeah. what other devices? Yeah. This to me, it just looks like it's just yeah. short. Yeah. But yeah. What is is that the yeah. router? Yeah. So I'll show that in a little minute. Uh, so that's the VPN. Okay. Uh, so that that's the VPN server here. Uh, on the corporate network. I'll explain it at the very end yeah, of the lecture. <laughs> and this is your Cisco client for your VPN here. So there's no hardware here, and it, I should show it happening here. So you run your Cisco VPN, it connects to the VPN server of your organization, and negotiate this crypto, and it tunnels right through the whole of the network. When it appears back here, then it's Unencrypted again, but it could still be encrypted. Why could it be encrypted? Did Alice set it encrypted in the first place. Yeah, but what? It's yeah, but what? What protocol would you be using that it would still be encrypted? TLS. Yeah. So if it was HTTPS that she was using, <coughs> even when it comes back at the VPN then it's still uh, 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 encrypted. It happens with Tor. You covered right up to the gateway exit of Tor. And if you want the whole, whole lot covered, it, it's still HTTP. So it's an overlay encryption method. But you can be sure that, that, the, that Starbucks say here can't see anything. So they won't be able to see your URL, the port that you're using, and so on. Tunnels. If you use HTTPS and rely on HTTPS, then they can see exactly what you're looking at, they can see your DNS and so on. But remember, your companies <coughs> often don't want to spy on you. So anything that fits a policy for the corporate network goes through the VPN. Anything that doesn't gets set off out of the out of the tunnel. So please make sure that you know. <laughs> If you have a corporate, so you don't get get in trouble, but you actually know what stuff's been tunneled to your corporate VPN network, which will be logged, and what other stuff. If you're watching YouTube or Netflix, does that go through the corporate network, and are they watching what movies you're you're watching? If it's if it's well set up, only the stuff that's relevant. The company goes through the VPN, and everything else uh, goes through the uh, through a non-VPN. It still goes through the same route. There's no special magic route for VPNs, but it's just all invisible to the intermediate nodes. Okay, so this mode typically is blocked in a corporate network, and you won't be able to create an end-to-end -end, uh, in banks and so on because we want to see uh, what is in the, the data. Okay, so there's our simple setup of it. Uh, we've run probably our VPN server here and then we'd connect into to that and create our, our, our tunnel. So the layer of security that we have is that uh, you have no security unless you have physical security. So in the physical security layer one, we make sure that all our servers are under key lock are in a, a zone that people can get into. You take people's phones off them, you take their USB sticks away from them. You'll find the data center is where in a building? On the ground floor, top floor, middle floor? Where would it be? Middle. Middle? Middle. Yeah. 
ground floor, risk someone coming in, top floor from the skylight, you put it in the middle, and then you usually put it in the middle of the building, and you have a restricted zone around it. Only certain people are allowed into this zone, and they must be accompanied by someone in the company, and you go into other places that uh, you shouldn't be able to allow to get into. And then at the next level, uh, we we, we uh, set up VLANs for it. So we segment that layer two with a switch. And this computer can't talk to that computer even though it's connected to the same switch. So the VLAN will isolate our networks and it's the core of security. VLAN your network and don't allow everybody to connect to the same VLAN uh, because you're just asking for trouble. You're pushing all your security up to the top layer and VLANs will multiply the bandwidth, where the more we move up, the more of a bottleneck it becomes. So the VLAN layout of your network should be the core of your security, and make sure even if you're connecting to Wi-Fi, your VLANs between uh, networks. So even though I connect to the same Wi-Fi, then uh, it's still isolated uh, from others. Okay, then we can trunk, we trunk, through 821Q, which is a cr trunk route. So that this VLAN in the US can talk to this VLAN in Japan and never pop back up to layer three. It's all done through this, uh, this trunking network. And it just looks as if you're connected to the same switch. But this one here can't talk to that one as it is just now. Then we move up into IP <coughs> to CP, and we obviously apply our rules into that, <coughs> into those layers, and then we have our connections, SYN, SYNAC, uh, and so on. So what does tunneling actually look like? So we see the first sign of our connection with our SYN, and we typically do it on our destination port in this case. So there's the SYN, the SYNAC, and then the ACK. So that's our layered model that, that we have. And that's our traditional, and that's the way that our networks uh, grew up. So then they discovered a thing called security. They go, oh, I didn't think about that. What are we going to do? And they said, well, I don't know. <laughs> Let's do something simple that just breaks the stack and sticks in a, a layer. So we can do it at different layers if we want. We can do it at any layer here. But the way that SSL does it is that it sticks itself into the layer about here. So everything below there isn't protected. <coughs> everything above that is protected uh, within the tunnel. And it's a machine-to-machine -machine tunnel. It's not an application-to-application -application tunnel. And that's the weakness of it. And that's the reason that uh, some companies will break end-to-end -end encryption, because it's just a machine-to-machine -machine, uh, uh, encryption. OK, so we, we, break, we break out. I should have shown it at the layer above. I apologize for that. It should be one layer up. It should be up between the transport layer. And we stick a sticking plaster layer in there, and then uh, everything below here is then in encrypted. So it doesn't matter where the data goes, then uh, the data itself is encrypted from, from the higher level layers. The data link, the network layer, and the transport layer are still there. So they are revealed. Uh, to uh, all of the devices that go along. So tunneling for SSL doesn't stop someone from looking at MAC addresses and IP addresses uh, and, uh, and so on. So you don't cover the network layer in terms of uh, when you're creating your, your, your tunnel. So in here, we then have different versions of the, of the protocol, and then that's placed inside the IP uh, packets. We then take each of the ports and we remap them onto new ports. So HTTP becomes uh, HTTPS and it's 443. By default, Telnet is the same protocol, but it's now 22 for SSH 
and all of our email stuff becomes uh, uh, SEs and it, it remaps it to a new port. Normally in a corporate environment, our, uh, these ports are blocked on the firewall uh, and these ports are, are enabled. And you'll find it very difficult to find a POP3 server. There are still millions of them around and they should be, but POP3 is a standard sign that something isn't quite right because it's not secured. And few, even ISPs, would allow you to, to connect because it's used for spamming, especially for uh, SMTP. Okay, so that's, that's our setup that, that, that we have there. Uh, so that's a normal connection that we do. Uh, we connect to 443, client connects to the server, server responds back, and so on. We then put, have what's called a client hello. So uh, we've got a whole lot of uh, network traces that you can go and have a look, and you will have to know this for the exam. So we'll give you a, a trace, and then you'll have to be able to search through it and see uh, the details of the, of the capture. Can, I, can everybody see this? Okay. <laughs> Okay, can you see that? All right, it's not great. Yeah, but we'll, uh, we'll get there. So what you should see is that uh, it all looks like gobble the gook eventually. But initially, you see the certificate and a few other things in there. But eventually, the one thing that that should say is that that just looks like noise. So the way you can determine if something's encrypted is that you do a sample of the bytes and if they're all equally probable, it has, uh, it's likely to be encrypted traffic. What other type of traffic or file type would you expect to see that, that randomness in? Do you know? Compressed files. Compressed files, yeah. Uh, we did some research here, and don't quote us on this. Uh, a good, good encryption like AES will be almost perfect entropy. Uh, uh, all bytes will be called compressed. It's just a little bit short of that. So you can actually determine if something that looks like a compressed uh, uh, data just by taking a packet, a few packets off from a connection and doing a quick check. Uh, you can test if something is encrypted or it could be uh, compressed. But both of them, somebody might have something to hide. So they both look very suspicious in terms of the, the traffic. Okay, so that's our, that's what our packet actually, that's our conversation uh, here. So the first thing we see is a client hello. So can anybody tell me who originates that? Just by looking at that packet, is it the client that's saying hello? Or is it the server saying hello? Client. Client. Why do you say that? Because the destination works is uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's it there. But you can see here, there's the IP address of the of the client because it's doing the SIN, and that's we're connecting to the server port. So just because it's 192, just don't assume that it's it's not a server in there. Uh, so in this case, we can see here a client uh, hello. So the client hello has in it this here. So you can search, and there's a bit in there that defines that this is a client hello, and there's a bit in here that defines 0301, defines that we're using TLS 1.0, and the magic of the internet means that we can upgrade that. So if that becomes a 02 at the end, we're using TLS 1.2, and the software knows that it has to interpret the packets in a, in a different way. But then the key thing that we see here is that uh, the client has told the server, here is what I would like to, uh, to use. So uh, it might be a desktop, I can support all these ciphers. So if we take this one here, uh, the client is saying, I, I, I accept a Diffie-Hellman key exchange with RSA, 256-bit CBC, and SHA-1 uh, for, for the hashing method. So you can see here, there's the list of them there. 
uh, from that. And it's telling you, well, if you're going to give me elliptic curve, here's the modes that I can accept. I can accept three types of curves, and, and there, there they are. So just in case you're going to go for that, I've got a MASCO processor or something on my device that will support it. Okay, so that's the, the client tells the server what ciphers it wants to pick from. And obviously the client could offer a really bad cipher suite. It could go for MD5 or uh, it could go for DES 56-bit keys. So from there, uh, the client now has to send what's called a, a, a server hello. In the server hello, you now get the certificate being sent to the client. The client will check the certificate. Uh, if we're using RSA encryption, we will take the public key that's on the certificate. If not, we just check that the certificate's valid and it looks OK uh, for the site that we're connecting to. Otherwise, we'd get an untrusted. If it's a self-signed certificate, it would be untrusted. So in this case, uh, what we see here, hopefully, is that uh, we'll get our result back. So that's our, our uh our certificate coming in here and there's a certificate that comes in and you could see before we it comes in unencrypted so we can actually see what it looks like and then from here we should be able to get our suite that we're uh, selecting so the client the server sends back what cipher it actually wants to, to use. In this case, uh, we're using a, a, a key exchange method here, and the client sends back the key that it, that it actually uh, wants to use. And then once it's in the tunnel, then we shouldn't be able to read uh, anything. <coughs> if we do have the keys, then Wireshark has a way for us to uh, import the keys. Uh, I might give you a little demo of that uh, later on. Uh, but if you've managed to get the encryption key which was used in the tunnel, you can add it into Wireshark and magically all your data packets appear as unencrypted. So although you, you won't be able to read this, if your company has kept the keys in, in, in some sort of way, and you need to go back six months and have a look at this Wireshark trace, you just pull the key down, you apply the key into Wireshark and it will all, it all be unencrypted for you. Unfortunately with uh, Heartbleed, what happened was that you could see, although it was in a tunnel, you could see every, every bit of uh, data that was, that was passed. Okay, so that's, <coughs> uh, that's what you do in the lab today, hopefully, and uh, you should be able to see that, that connection. Okay, so there's the, the client hello that we've, that we've got. So the client hello uh, goes off, uh, and the client hello shows you all the cipher suites that you want to actually use. The server then responds back to the server hello, and it will actually say, well, I want to use uh, this here. So in this case, uh, the server has picked off RSA uh, key exchange, uh, three DES, uh, EDE, that's that encryption, decryption, encryption again, and SHA-1. So the contract is now bound. Uh, the client now has to generate uh, the key from the public key that's been sent as part of the exchange, sends that back, and you now have your, your key exchange uh, in, in there. And that's the way that it actually works. In fact, there is the key coming back here. So if you wanted to sniff that key that was coming back, then uh, what we've done is we've used the public key of the server, we've encrypted it, and there it is uh, there. So if you know the private key of the other site, then you can decrypt that. So if you're doing that on your own network, you already have the private key, you pop that back into Wireshark, and you'll, you'll be able to reveal uh, all of the traffic. But Eve, who's sitting here, even though she sees that, she can't decrypt it because she doesn't have the, what key does she not have? 
private. the private key of the server in there. But if Google get releases that, uh, then all of the keys that have been encrypted with that private key uh, and public key are, are now open. If somebody's listened to all of these communications, uh, I'll show you a little back door in, uh, in Chrome. <laughs> Unbelievably, <laughs> a little switch that you can put on in your computer, your computer, no one else's computer, and it stores all your keys. And uh, you can just take those keys and you load them into Wireshark and it all reveals it all. So I'll, I'll hopefully give you a little demo of that after, after the break. Okay, so we're also using uh, uh, OpenSSL to do this. So we see the whole negotiation actually in OpenSSL when, when we do this uh, 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 S-Connect, Client Connect. And you can see the certificate coming through. We also see the cipher suites. And there is a cipher being negotiated there. So with OpenSSL, we can find out what protocol. And that's what Scott will, will do uh, when he's assessing a website. He will do this connection. And then he'll be able to find out what suite the client will pick off. If he gives lots of, uh, lots of uh, ciphers, which one does the server uh, actually pick uh, in, in there? And there's a key there uh, from that, that connection. Okay, so that's the that's the tunnel, right? So when we see <coughs> it in Wireshark, we see it like that. That's the key exchange method, that's the encryption method, and that, that's the hash there. So these are well-defined uh, uh, codes that that we that we see. Hopefully, my laptop will finish sometime soon. Just a bit. I'll bring this over here. <coughs> Charge it up. That's what happens when you run a VM. It uh, it just runs away with the power. <laughs> okay, so that's that's the. That's the kind of ciphers that we that we see. <coughs> okay, so in the lab today, we'll set up a little Python program to to see what this SSL connection uh, looks like. So this is me setting up a server. Uh, it's not multi-threaded and all that kind of nice stuff. This is just a basic connection. So in this case, uh, I'm adding my certificate onto there. I set up a, a, a server port here, in this case on 444. And then I set the, the, the cipher suite that I want on the connection to have. Okay. So this is locking down exactly what the SSH, uh, uh, the SSL connection will actually be for this connection. I can have more that I want, I can support more ciphers, but you probably don't want to do that. You probably want to pick something that is actually secure. So the client looks like that. Okay, the client is just going to connect in from here. It's going to send a get, just a standard get that we would get for the, for the page. And again, in this case, it, we will pick off what the ciphers are and we should be able to connect. So hopefully you can do that in the lab today and get that to actually work. And then we should be able to see for our connection that it will only pick the cipher that we've actually defined uh, here. So in the end, our connection only involves this one, which is an uh, electric curve with the Hellman, with RSA, a 256-bit AES, TCM, and SHA-384, which is what we've selected. So then there's been a lot of problems with our, with uh, TLS 1.2 and a lot of problems that have lasted for about a decade that we've never addressed and they just keep coming back again. So TLS 1.3 has been drafted. Some people try to put a back door into it. So it becomes a uh, 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 IETF will broadcast to say that they're drafting a standard. Lots of people can add their little bits and pieces. 
and then they must decide what goes into it. Uh, there was a consortium in the US uh, that included the banks that wanted to put a back door in, uh, in data centers so that they could look at the, at the connections. That didn't go forward, and what we ended up with was this one uh, here. So the TLS 1.3, unfortunately, has this weakness. So they tried to, the, the, the whole three-way handshake thing is pretty rubbish. It takes a long time to create a connection and rip it up. Something needs to change for that. So TLS 1.3 has a faster way. It has a zero round trip time, and you can create uh, connections fast. Unfortunately, these receptors have already found that there's a problem uh, in it already. So it's not perfect, but it's better. Uh, and they even admit it themselves, if you read the RFC at the end, <laughs> they say, we know there's a problem with a zero round trip time. Uh, just watch what you're doing. <laughs> okay, so somebody could do this at scale, and it's a race between uh, trying to fix this. Uh, it's a weaponization thing. Somebody could weaponize against this for it has, but it's been shown that it, that it, is, it does have a problem. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll have a break for five minutes, and then I'll go over uh, IP set. Right. Okay, let's go. Uh, so I'll give you, I'll give you a, qu a quick demo of, uh, of a vulnerability and to show how Wireshark can actually read the, the, the keys. So this is the option here uh, that, that, that we have. If you, if you scroll down uh, uh, to the protocols, you'll find there's a pre-master secret log file uh, here. So if you manage to get a list of all the keys that have been used, then you can load up Wireshark with all those keys, and then it will pick the key that's, that's required for uh, each session. Uh, and the unbelievable thing, uh, just play this, is that uh, for some reason Chrome and Firefox have a little switch uh, that you set up in, in Windows, and uh, that that switch allows the keys to be stored into a file, so the user wouldn't actually know that the keys were being stored for every connection. So it's almost like a little backdoor. So I, I don't know if there's a debugging option that that wasn't uh, switched off, but in this uh, so in this demo that I'll send you the details. So this, that's what the keys actually look like on the machine. So in this demo, I, I erase, I've just erased that file just to show clean that this actually happens. Uh, then uh, from there, I'm going to set up uh, the details here. So there. Uh, so there's that. Yeah. Okay. So, so what I did there, there's a variable called I think it's SSA, SSL uh, home, and if you enable that at uh, path that that uh, system variable, it will log to a certain file. Uh, so I go and uh, so you can see already with inside that file that I've just created I went to Google and it's already started to dump all the keys that uh, I'm actually uh, using here uh, so then you can go and, and browse lots of uh, HTTPS sites and every site that you visit the keys will be stored so it's worrying because the user would never know that actually they were being uh, tracked, but all the keys are actually stored into a file that may be hidden somewhere uh, on, on their, th their computer. Uh, it was difficult to see what the thing was there that I set up, but it's one of the, 
system system environment variables uh, here it's here uh, I set up SSL key log file and give a file name try it tonight to see if it's still enabled set up that that system environment variable give it the name of the file that you want to log to and you'll find all your keys should get put in there and then as you as you surf you and we're, we're recording with a uh, Wireshark so everything that we should see so the place that you've got to go to to actually set up your keys as I showed you before is in here somewhere there's so many different protocols for, for Wireshark but within SSL you'll find there's a place where you can import your, your, your keys so that you can look at all your uh, all the tunnels that you're creating and then when we actually look so I'm going through and using secure connections all the time and then uh, when I go and actually have a look and I load up the data uh, from this demo you'll be able to see that I can see in plain text what was actually in, in the tunnel. So this shows you, like in many corporate environments, you'll, you'll be running a smart firewall. The users think they're connecting through a tunnel, but actually the keys are being stored uh, in some way so that they can actually determine uh, them and all your networking devices can actually still read the, the packets that are, that are created uh, in the in, in the tunnel. Okay, so I'll send you this this link, but it's quite kind of shocking that you can actually see what's actually in the tunnel, uh, and eventually you should be able to see that 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 detail. Okay, so that's that uh, shows you the uh, some of the problems that you can actually have uh, with with the tunnel. So let's have a look at what. Uh, uh, VPN uh, actually looks like. So I appreciate this. This might seem quite complex, but this is the right way to do it. So don't rely on a lightweight SSL connection. A lot of VPNs now are lightweight VPNs, and they're using SSL underneath. In a secure environment, you shouldn't set that up, and it needs to be proper IPsec uh, underneath. So the ways that we can set up a tunnel is that we can go for a layer 2 tunnel, which is obviously going to be faster, uh, but they tend not to be as secure. So the L2TP is a layer 2 <laughs> tunneling, so you can tunnel over a, a, a network and link your layer 2 uh, on, on either side. Or you can use the point-to-point -point <coughs> tunneling method. For our, our VPN access, uh, we typically have uh, extra nets where we connect two trusted sites together over a VPN uh, uh, network. So it's one company connected to another over this trusted infrastructure. We can have an in intranet type uh, approach where uh, we can link two sites together to create our, our, our linked networks. Or what happens mostly when we're connecting uh, uh, remotely uh, from home, say, or, or when we're on the, the road, we connect into a VPN access and it gives us direct access onto the corporate network. So as I showed you before, our two tunnels are end-to-end. -end. Remember what that one was called? Transport. Transport. And then this one is tunneled. Okay, most of the time it's that one that we use and we tunnel across the network and we don't really use that one in, in there. So how do we how do we actually block it? Well, we use port uh, uh, UDP port 500 to do the negotiation. If we block that, then no tunnel is going to happen. So in a corporate network, we just detect and we block on the firewall by uh, port 500. Also in TCP protocol 50 and 51, and the TCP header identifies that we're using encrypted packets or an authenticated header within uh, IPsec. So we can look inside the protocol field and TCP and determine whether somebody is using a tunnel uh, or, or not. <coughs> the way that IPsec is set up is that we can either encrypt uh, the full packet uh, using ESP 
or we can authenticate just the header or we can put both of them in together so we can authenticate the header to stop replay attacks and we can have encryption uh, in there. Every single thing that you do adds an overhead. So your VPN server is going to be your bottleneck for your whole company. If it doesn't have enough memory or grunt, then people are going to slow down uh, their whole communications. So you would typically make sure that you had GPUs in this device and lots of memory, and you would have a failover for your VPN server, because if it fails, then you're going to have trouble in connecting to remote sites and so on. So the authentication that it covers uh, uh, is, is important then. And as I said, uh, that should show the TCP header. But in the TCP header, uh, the protocol field, if it's a 50 or a 51, it means that somebody's using uh, IPsec in, in there. So what does it look like in real life? And I, and I want, I would uh, examine something like this. But that's what your, the setup looks like. In some of the systems now are going for a one-phase uh, connection. But normally you have a two-phase connection. So the first phase is where you negotiate uh, the crypto that you're going to use. So I say that I want to use uh, SHA-1, uh, DES, Diffie-Hellman and so on. So that's defining the crypto policy that we're going to negotiate here. And this is on our Cisco PIX uh, ASA device here. And then in phase two, we can actually define uh, the the actual kernel mode that, that, we're, that we're actually going to do, and define the policy. So what traffic goes through the tunnel, and what traffic doesn't go through the tunnel is negotiated at, uh, at phase two of, of it. So when we look at our, our packets on the line, we see something like this. So this is an IPsec negotiation. And again, here we go, there's the cipher suites been defined by the client again. So the client's been set up to be able to look, so if we find our IPsec <coughs> here IP. that's there <coughs> I'll just open that up so what should we be looking for here? What do you think we're going to get when we open this up, what's the key things that you would look for? Key exchange. Yeah, key exchange. And we should see this, uh, this uh, UDP traffic uh, coming, coming through. And we'll just have a look at the connection can find the connection. Uh, so there we go. Source. There. Okay, so there's the there's the methods coming through. So each of these is some sort of cipher that, that we want to use. Uh, Change. So just like before, when we, uh, we we saw the negotiation, the IPsec will give us the, the ciphers that that we want to support uh, from there. <coughs> okay, so that so that shows an example there of uh, the transformations the the. The cipher suites that we want to use. There's 14 different types there that the server can then pick off the one that it wants to use, and then when it's in there, it will all be set up. So how can we determine what is going through the tunnel and what isn't? So your your routing table is your fundamental thing on your Mac and on your Windows machine, and will actually tell you where all the traffic is going. So this is my routing table here and we can see what's my default gateway. 
Yeah, so all the traffic is going through there. Okay, so anything that isn't destined for the local network gets sent to that gateway, that's my Wi-Fi access point. So when I enable my Cisco uh, IPsec, then my routing table uh, differs. So now I see this, and that uh, anything that's default, that I can't find a route for, gets sent to my default gateway, and it'll route to the internet, that's fine. But now we've got all these entries here, which will actually define the networks that then get uh, routed. So if I go to 146.176.1.10, say, then the routing ta table tells me to send it to that uh, IP address there. That IP address is actually the, the gateway of the, uh, the VPN server for Napier. And this is the network connection that it's just added to my machine, which will then link to the Napier network. Anything that doesn't match these things will go where? Default gateway. Default gateway. Okay, so this tells you, and this tells you the scope. Anything that, uh, <coughs> so for a subnet mask of this, anything from 146176 will actually be sent to here, which is a, a default. It's not going through the, uh, the, the VPN server in this case, it just gets sent to the interface and then it'll be onto the Napier network, and it's not going through the, the VPN server. So it's this table here that gives you exactly what <coughs> your connections actually are. Okay, so there's, there's uh, our table here, which was an example. So then if I uh, do a trace route to Napier before the VPN tunnel is in, you can see it goes through uh, the Eastman, it goes to London, and then goes run uh, up through Janet, and then round the Eastman uh, network, and you can see it eventually gets off the Eastman network uh, to, to the Napier here. But then I apply my VPN, and you can see we can't see any of these uh, intermediate modes anymore. Is it taking a different route? Why is it changed? It takes the same route. But we can't see any of the intermediate nodes anymore because it's tunneled right the way through. If we then go to intel.com and do trace route, we can see that we see it here and then we see it the same here. So in this case, it hasn't went through uh, the tunnel. Okay, so that's hopefully give you an outline. We've got lots of practical things to do in the lab uh, today to use SSL labs and so on, uh, but really get into the Wireshark and have a look to see if you can understand uh, the client hello and the server hello. So as we do every week, so if you get your phones out, we'll do a little panel test if this is going to work. It's going to work. Okay, so get yourself registered. Don't swear. <laughs> Did you miss the code? <laughs> 45 33 87. If you get t shirts in a row, then I don't know, you get a full coat or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we all started. And there, oh my internet connection isn't great, so hopefully this is going to be okay. Hopefully it's going to be okay. Okay, we'll get ready. First question, which port does HTTPS use? 8080-443-22-445 and 465. Everybody's voted, and it is of course 443. It isn't 8080, it's not 22, and it's not 445, and definitely not 465. 445 is always blocked. 22 is SSH. 8080 is 
yeah, kind of proxy. Let's hide the server. Only here for the quiz. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, they were all really fast with that one. Drop table answers. <laughs> That's a legacy from yesterday, is it? Oh, that injection didn't work, did it? Okay, let's let's do another one. Will be was fastest there. Let's start the next one. Okay, so for this one, uh, which port does SMTPS use? SMTP is the email service for sending emails standard port for spamming uh, somebody can spam through there 443 22 445 465 for 80 it's a bit of a trivial thing if you ever get for who wants to be a millionaire then it's a good thing to maybe <laughs> remember and yeah it's uh, 465 is the port well done you were listening uh, a bit Okay, so Spartan Green did well there, Babies is doing well, uh, Hashberg always does well, but uh, it's Clive, that's a new, who's Clive, who's Clive, good, well done, you, you always do well at the start, don't you, and then <laughs> slip away a wee bit, okay, so it's uh, Clive and Jabot and Hashberg and Top Hat and Spartan Green and Babies and DPA and Drop Table Answers and Mikiro and Fazala, Fazala. Good. So for the next one, <coughs> uh, what is the first TLS SSL packet sent? Client hello, server hello, either a client hello or a server hello. Is it a client hello, a server hello, or either of those? And the answer is client hello. Well done. Good. Uh, server hello comes after it. The client hello contains what? Cypher suites. And the server hello? The actual, the actual cypher suites. Well done. That's great. <coughs> okay, here we go. And it's mm, Hashberg did well. Uh, you all did very well there. It might be Hashberg. <coughs> oh, Jabot. Top there. And Eve. Good. Good to see Eve in there. Okay, for the next one. <laughs> In a tunnel, which is the key handshaking method of a cipher suite of that? Diffie Hellman with RSA, 128-bit AES, SHA-256, or 256-bit AES? Which is the key handshaking method in that long string? Oh. Yeah, it's uh, Diffie-Hellman, Diffie-Hellman, RSA, the first part is the key exchange, second part is the symmetric key, <laughs> and the last part is the hashing method. Uh, so, um, yeah, so my advice here is when it says key, handshaking method, never think of AES, never think of SHA uh, at all, so it's, it's, the, it's this one here. So that's, uh, that's good. So... For this one, I think it's Jabot, only here for the quiz, it's back in again, doing well. Ah, drop table answers is right in there. I wonder if there's something going on in there. Uh, <coughs> hopefully you see yourself there somewhere. <laughs> Actually, question five. Uh, what's the hashing method in TLS, DHA, RSA, blah, Diffie Hellman, AES, SHA, uh, AES. That's the hashing method in there. Please get this right. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, you want me to say it a hundred times? Diffie Hellman method is a key exchange method. I'll say it a hundred times if you, if you want. SHA is our hashing method. Uh, AES is our, our symmetric key method in there. Oh. <coughs> so here we go. And drop table answers could be top this time. No, Jabot's still in there. Not really changed that much there. Six. 
to block an IPsec VPN connection on your network, which port do we block? TCP 50, TCP 443, UDP 53, UDP port 500 or UDP port 50? TCP port 50. Oh, that was quick. And it's UDP port 500. Uh, if you find that you can't connect to your VPN server, there's a good chance that somebody somewhere is blocking your port 500 UDP. <coughs> and Babies has done well there. Clive is back in there again, and Jabot didn't do that well that time. And it's making the suit again. How many t-shirts have you got? <laughs> One, two, three, yeah, a few. Uh, DPA has been there, Hashberg, and Liam is in there. It's good, Liam. Is Liam? Good, well done, Liam. Only here for the quiz, not doing so well. I'm glad about that. And babies, yeah, always about the middle for babies. Is it your babies? Is it your, yes, you yeah. <laughs> Okay, Hashberg is, is my favourite one. Hashberg is who? Who's Hashberg? Yeah, good. Okay, you should get the hashing questions right then. Eh? <coughs> okay, question seven. In IPsec mode, which IPsec mode? <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, okay. Well, take, a, take a random choice. With <laughs> option one, option two, or option three. I really want you to get this one right. Okay, you've got one second to get this one. And uh, that's it. We'll show the winner. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'll roll. You're all wrong. It's option four. That's it. So, so I, th I think we have Mickey, Mickey uh, again. So 15.51 again. So that, thank you very much. Well done. Okay, does anybody have any questions about what we did and the content there? Your brains are fried and all. It's, it's difficult uh, and it's one of the least understood areas in the industry. Uh, get together 100 cybersecurity professionals and ask them how uh, TOS and SSL really works without explaining just that it's a little game thing that appears. Uh, you'll find that there's a general weakness around certificates, TOS, SSL, and PKI, uh, uh, particularly. So uh, it's it's a worry that there it is the core of security on the internet, and there is such uh, such poor uh, knowledge of it. Does anybody have any questions about the coursework, about your exam next week, and what's involved? You can ask questions in the in the lab if you want. Does anybody have any? It's um, units one to six. Test units, what is that? The test. Two to five, uh, two, three, four, five. Okay. Four units, uh, symmetric key hashing, public key, and key exchange. Okay, that's So this, this <coughs> isn't covered till next time. Next week we'll do the amazing, fantastic blockchain stuff. So we'll get your cryptocurrency ready, and I'll get you all to buy a few bitcoins. <laughs> oh, the week after, sorry, the week after. So I'll rewind again. In two weeks' time, we'll be doing blockchains, and uh, you'll all be refreshed after all your tests that you've been you've been doing. So we'll do a bit of blockchain. We'll do some cryptocurrency, and we'll really try and understand what this new world is that we're actually uh, creating um, through through blockchain. Anybody? Any questions at all? No. Good. Okay then. Well, I'll see you in the lab in in a, in a wee while. And